Well, hello again. Our next speaker is a creative technologist who specializes in music technologies, craft-based electronics, and education. She is known for inventing the Minimu DIY children's gesture controlled instrument and as the author of the Crafty Kids Guide to DIY Electronics. Her talk today will showcase making and hacking's influence on music throughout history. And she'll also take a look at some of her projects with artists in London and Berlin. Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Helen Lee. Hello, let me take this off of here. Hello, <laughs> I'm Helen um, and I'm a hardware hacker and general purpose art tech weirdo. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about the history of hacking in music technology and how a small group of strange people um, played with technology and changed the face of mainstream audio production. I'm also gonna take you through some of my projects um, as a way to illustrate some of the cool things that are coming out of the music technology hacking scenes in London and Berlin. So before I start that, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, <clears throat> I am, a, broadly speaking, a creative technologist, um, which means that I like hacking on things, and I also like making art, and I like smushing the two together as much as humanly possible. Um, my main form of art that I do is music um, and experimental instrument design, and my main form of technology that I like is electronics and hardware, um, hence why I'm here. Um, so I make experimental instruments and hardware interface, uh, interfaces for music. Um, and this is uh, one of my sculptures. So I make um, sonic circuit sculptures um, using a variety of unusual materials. Um, I was, I, I'll tell you about this project a little bit later on and we'll hear it as well. This is actually a subwoofer bass. Um, which I hope will play. Um, and um, as well as doing, uh, this is made of brass as well, um, and I'm, I make a lot of things with soft circuits as well. Um, I've got one of those with me. Um, now, surprisingly, I don't make my living making experimental sound sculptures. That's um, not something you generally pay your rent with. Um, but I do, um, I do manage to put my work from my experimental music into the stuff that I get paid to do as well. So this is um, one of the things I do. I do um, product design um, and uh, um, educational experience design. Um, this is, I was the lead developer on this kit, um, which is sold by Adafruit and Micro Center and blah, blah, blah. Um, I developed it with Imogen Heap and um, P. Moroni, who are like the British Adafruit, I guess. Um, and this is my hand on the box, also a hand model. Um, <laughs> it's like, ooh, they photoshopped my hand, I think. I've got really wonky hands. Um, but, so I make products. I've done some stuff on Kickstarter um, products and you know, mainstream things and blah, blah, blah. Um, this is an educational product. It is an instrument, but it is an instrument that is designed to teach children how to code. Um, um, education is extremely important to me, um, so it's um, one of the themes throughout my work as well as music technology. This is a still from my book. Um, I make, um, I, I'm really interested in alternative materials, in electronics, and one of the things I really like to do is take traditional craft materials and um, see how I can make, uh, how, can, how I can make inventions through them. And the, the, the thing that really interests me um, is electronic embroidery um, and using um, squishy circuits, essentially. I think that's kind of really interesting and, um, and tactile. Um, so, yeah, that's a brief introduction to me, writing, product stuff, weird art um, with music. Um, so, onwards to the talk. Um, so, this is the signal that the talk has started because it's a very pretentious quote by a very pretentious man called John Cage. God rest his soul. He's um, probably most famous for his silent composition, 433, where nobody plays anything and the audience is just like, Jesus Christ, really. Um, <laughs> so someone's described his work as um, more interesting to think about than to actually listen to, which I can um, attest to being absolutely the correct case. Um, but he was also a hardware hacker, um, so which not many people know about him. Um, he's probably one of the more um, famous people in experimental music, but 
there has always been experimental music. And the reason I put this quote up there is to remind you that all music is invented and so are all instruments. Um, and so is all music. Um, so something that might be experimental today might be mainstream in 10 years' time. People like uh, who we'd think of as classical music mainstays as Debussy, Strauss, and Stravinsky, they were all considered avant-garde and controversial in their time. A violin wasn't a violin until actually very recently. Um, it took 10 centuries of iteration um, for the violin to look like and look and sound like it does today, which by anyone's standards is a pretty long product development cycle. Um, and even the note A, the middle A, is 440 hertz, right? Okay, we all know that. But did you know that it actually wasn't 440 hertz until 1953, when a group of dudes sat down in a room and signed an international accord? Previous to that, a French violin, uh, sorry, a French flute would sound very different to an um, Italian flute. Um, and actually, it's one of my favorite conspiracy theories. I'm big, a big lover of ridiculous conspiracy theories, but there is, a, there is an ongoing conspiracy theory that the reason for 440 hertz was chosen um, was a Nazi mind control experiment. It's population control. And there are websites now where you can upload your music, which is 442 hertz, and it will pitch change it to be uh, for A to be three, uh, 432. 432 is the most common one, but there are competing ones. There's 438. And there's even some madmen who think that A should be 530 something. Anyway, if you enjoy conspiracy theories like I do, it's a, it's a funny rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, so basically my point really is that music is made up. You know, it's, it's an experiment. It's an experiment um, as, that is as old as human history. Um, but this is a story of how people took um, a, a piece of technology um, and hacked it um, to change things. Um, so the, this is a magnetic reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which was invented kind of in the 1920s. Um, it, was, it made lots of um, leaps. Um, in the 1940s, the Nazis used it to um, uh, to, do, um, to edit propaganda. So previously to this bad boy, um, we were all, all broadcasts were either live or they were um, phonographs, right? So you can't edit a phonograph and you can't edit a live recording. This was the first time you could actually edit something. And the way that you do that, and that's, this is the technology that the Nazis developed for their propaganda, was you would record it onto the magnetic tape. Okay, great, fine, excellent. And you could then chop pieces out with a scalpel and stick it back together with sticky tape. So it was a very physical process. So they kept that under their belts. We didn't, nobody else apart from the Nazis had this technology until after World War II. Um, and this advanced technology. Um, after World War II, it exploded everywhere. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, we can edit things. This is very exciting. So they started editing things with this, and, they would, and this became like the uh, predominant um, broadcast technique, reel-to-reel. -reel. Um, now, in the 1940s, a, group of, um, a small group of recording artists in Paris um, has, had access to one of these. Um, and they started to think, how can we muck around with this? As you, you know, humans love to muck around with technology. So they took this, and instead of just editing normal text or sorry, no, normal speech or um, normal music, they decided they thought, what happens if we switch it around? What happens if we speed it up and slow it down? What happens if we mess with it in the, all these different ways? And this is a group of people called uh, the Music Concrete. Um, we've got Stockhausen and Schaefer are probably the most famous ones, but it was actually a small group of music tech hackers um, who got together and made these god-awful recordings, which you can still hear on YouTube today. This, this sounds terrible. Um, but it, it's not about the sound that they made. It was the techniques that they developed during the creation of that sound, which had huge impact on the whole of music production. Um, so let's have a look at this. This is... Um, one in, 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 um, in action. Before I start, it, there's two, two things you need to understand about, um, mus uh, about a sound, um, is that it has um, attack, which is how quickly it starts, and then, um, and then a decay, which is how, how much it drops off. Okay, so think about a, a violin. Again, if you pluck a violin string, um, it will, the sound will start immediately, and then it will resonate, and depending on the room it's in, or depending on the body of the violin, it will fade away over a certain amount of time, right? So it's like, boom! and then it fades away. So that's the attack and the decay. 
Um, now, these experimenters uh, discovered that if you turned the tape around, you switched it around, this same sound could have a long attack, so it would start off really quiet and then whoom, and then stop very, very quickly. Now, this sound is very hard to achieve in nature, so we were able to then, by recording different things, switching them round, speeding them up, which changes the pitch up, slowing them down, which slows the pitch down, they were able to create entirely new sounds that, that are not found in nature. Um, so these, these uh, let me, I'll play this, you can see it happening. It's very short, here we are. Oh, great, there's no sound. Thank you. Um, so this is, um, I'll just do that again. You get the idea. This is what they decided, this is what they were creating. And these techniques um, led to looping, which is when you loop something. I mean, here you go, we know that is. It led to sampling. It led to the idea of found sound. So these were portable. So you could actually go around and record things in, na in nature. It wasn't just studio recording um, because of this. Composite sounds, distortion, gain, all of these techniques that we take for granted now were actually invented by a small group of music tech hackers in Paris in the 1940s. And as I say, their music was awful, but their impact was absolutely huge. Um, this was generally, um, it took about 20 years for it to filter through into the mainstream. Um, and this was probably the big, the foot, well, no, I know it was. It was the first big track that used these music concrete techniques. Now, remember, when you listen to this, well, I'm going to just stop playing it. There we are, that's enough of that. Great track, though. Um, so, some weirdo hackers changed rock and roll production forever. Awesome. Uh, but one of my favorite things about hacker culture is not necessarily what one group of hackers does, but what the ripple effect of that technology um, is. You know, you don't know when you create something, especially when you open source something and share something like we do in our community, you have no idea what kind of impact it will have on other people, what little nuggets of information they'll pick up and run with. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about their influence on somebody else who's also incredibly influential. Does anyone know who this is? No, well, you should do. She's called Daphne Oram. Um, she's the founder of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, which is an iconic sound design. It was one of the birthplaces of Foley um, art. It was the, one of the birthplaces of electronic music. Um, hugely, hugely influential, but she's largely lost her history, which is very sad to me. Um, so she's a trained musician. This is Daphne. Daphne. She's a working class lass from, um, from the north of England. Um, and she, um, she was a trained musician with an interest in electronics and physics. Um, and in the 1940s, um, as a woman, you didn't often get to do very interesting jobs. Um, but she managed to get a job at the BBC queuing up reel-to-reel -reel tape recording. And she went on a training course. She went, she went to a conference, actually, much like this, but um, in black and white. Um, and... <laughs> Um, <laughs> she went to a conference in Paris where she met the, um, the founders of Music Concrete, and it blew her mind. She was like, oh my god, this tech is so cool, I want to go home and, and play with it. And she saw this uh, huge, um, the, the huge potential for it. So she went back to the BBC and she's like, guys, guys, I've just seen this really cool thing. Like, can we, can we do some of this? And they're like, no, go back to your studio. So she did, she went back to her studio, but after work, um, she would steal the keys um, of a recording studio, and she'd run around the BBC and collect equipment and experiment with things. Um, and she would do this for seven years until she finally convinced somebody to let her um, do the soundtrack to, um, I think it was a sci-fi sci-fi uh, sci track. Um, so she, she did the sci-fi uh, soundtrack um, and it went, uh, it went live and it blew everybody's minds because it was these sounds that nobody had ever heard before. They were like, what is this? It's not a violin. You know, um, and she, it, was, it proved enormously popular. She got asked to do more and more and more. And then something unprecedented happened for the 1950s. This was the early 1950s as well. She got given her own studio which is the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. And she got given a team to work on this sound design and to work on these experimental sounds for incidental music or um, soundtracks or so on. Um, and um, 
Then she left, um, saying, they wanted my work, they wanted my ideas, but they didn't want me. So she trained up a bunch of men and was excluded from her, work, from, uh, her life's work largely, which was pretty sad, but, um, you know. She went on to do cool things. She's, um, uh, she's got an uh, amazing invention in the Science Museum in London called the Oramics Machine. She went on to create these wild avant-garde synthesizers at her own art studio. So even though she wasn't able to... Um, keep hold of her creation at the BBC, um, she was able to have a profound um, lasting impact and go on to make some really interesting art as well. So we're not going to go and see her synthesizer, but what we are going to do is continue looking at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop with somebody else who is also extremely iconic, who Daphne um, left the door open for. This is Delia Derbyshire. Do you know who Delia Derbyshire is? Yes, there's like a couple of people. Yeah, she's more famous. Actually, the reason we know about Daphne Oram is because of uh, music tech nerds who've gone backwards in time from Delia Derbyshire. Um, Delia Derbyshire um, was the um, arranger and co-composer of this. Um, so let's see if it plays. All right. While this is playing, which I think it should be playing. No. Why did it not play? It takes a while to come in. Anyway, so the Doctor Who theme tune was recorded in 1963. In 1963, there were no synthesizers. Why? Oh, it's coming in. Good. Great. Um, so when you listen to this, think that there are no instruments on this. None. Most people think that there's a theremin on it. It's not true. All of these sounds are created with signal generators. She had a bank of 12 signal generators that were used for teaching electronic, for testing electronic circuits. And they produced a sine wave and a square wave. And what she would do is record them, pitch shift it up, pass it through something that she'd made called a wobulator. Um, and do different white noise filters on it. And every single note on this has been cut out and sellotaped together, which is very painstaking um, and very, very impressive. She was an absolute visionary, very, very um, influential. Then this, there's a wonderful documentary about her um, just, uh, for, that was made for Delia Derbyshire Day. Um, so yeah, we are. Doctor Who, we love this. Um, oh, she was also like something, she was also very laissez faire about it. Oh, another cool thing is they didn't have multi track recorders back then either. So they're all the different tracks that you're hearing was literally just people around a room on different tracks and they're like three, two, one, and then they all press their track together. So it was absolutely, and then they would re record it in the studio. It was like absolutely bonkers. And she um, was asked about the process um, and um, and, um, and her, her response was just a shrug and seems to work. <laughs> Which is largely how I talk about all of my technology. Not sure how, but kind of works. So yeah, Delia Derbyshire, we love her, we love her. Oh, this is, um, this is something that actually is fairly unrelated, but this is a track that she composed. I wanted to put it in here because it's an absolute banger. Um, again, made, this was made for a, in the 1960s for an Asimov. Um, for um, an Asimov screenplay, which unfortunately is lost to time. The BBC have lost the, um, the sci-fi program that she made this for. So it's really cool. Actually, um, Dee Anderbert um, made a track that was just this, um, with them rapping over it. But it's a really um, amazing, modern sound vibe, and she did this with scalpels and sticky notes. So, yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, so you should listen to that. It's called Zooey Zooey Ooh Ooh Ooh. Classic track name. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm going to leave the BBC Radiophonic Workshop there. But um, I wanted to end for, um, for this segment of my talk on, on this quote. And I'm sorry, BBC Radiophonic Workshop engineer, I forgot his name. I think it might be Mike Ayres, but I, uh, I can't remember who said this to me. Um, but um, this is a, just a really nice quote, which is um, really, to me, um, sums up music hacking is like none of us know what we're doing, and that's okay. Um, you know, the important the, there's an importance of allowing for outsider influence on mainstream technology, and there's an important it's important to remember that all music is made up. None of us really know what we're doing, and that's kind of okay. Um, and you know, great creativity can come from um, great ignorance. <laughs> with a little bit of knowledge. So it's, um, I think experimentation is very, very important in creative technology. 
So, BBC Radiophonic Workshop, what a golden age for music tech hacking. Um, and I think that now also is a golden age for music tech hacking for kind of the same reasons. There was a small, dedicated community that would just share their knowledge with each other, um, which led to great leaps forward. And there was new, available, cheap technology. And the same situation is true today. We have an incredible community at our fingertips nowadays. And we also have lots and lots of really cool, cheap technology. Um, and excitingly, people like us here, we're all so accessible. I've met so many people on the internet that, we've, uh, that I've shared um, music tech stuff with. Um, and I think that's the key point, really. Um, places like this, this is, a, this is a hacker space that I used to belong to in London, which had a big music focus. This is actually a musical instrument here. Um, and maker spaces, hacker spaces, community is super important. Um, the sharing um, and the influence cannot be understated. I think we often think about, um, about uh, great inventions and great leaps forward in technology or great leaps forward in art as something that is um, driven forward by a small number of people or some kind of lone genius, but that's an absolute myth. You know, even Picasso wouldn't have been Picasso without Georges Braque or Henri Matisse, you know? It's, um, it's a community effort, and we all push each other forward by sharing. So make spaces. The other thing that's really cool, actually, um, is is the uh, music tech community in um, in, uh, in 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 uh, words. My God, <laughs> um, the music tech community share a lot on YouTube. So there's this is a guy called Sam. Um, he's got a YouTube channel called Look My New Computer. Um, this is his Furby organ, which is as horrific as it sounds. Um, so if you want to have nightmares, you should definitely look that up. But um, as well as playing his cr creations, um, he shares teardowns of them, shares how they've done it as well. So th these kind of, and Sam's a great example of somebody who's very open about their technology and is very open about sharing uh, and does really cool things. Um, and then the, the uh, final thing uh, that I think, one of the reasons why I think that um, there's a, a renaissance in music tech hacking, as well as the spaces, um, as well as um, YouTube and Twitter, um, is, is the, the, uh, the events, events like this. This is a, this is a hacker camp in, in, in uh, London where uh, um, you um, basically hack on stuff just like this, you know, but outside in a field in, 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 uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, the reason I put this slide up here is because of the technology that I'm wearing here probably cost like $20. Um, 20 years ago, this wasn't possible. We're able now to create very, very powerful pieces of technology with very, very little money. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why I think it's all very exciting. Um, so I'm now going to show you some of my projects um, as a way to fangirl about the project, about the technology that I used with them, and also to talk about the work of some of the other core people in London and Berlin, which are the two major cities I've lived in in the last, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and both of them have huge music tech communities. Um, so, um, this is one of my creatures. If it'll play, there we go, okay. So I make these circuit sculptures. I was inspired by um, Mohit and Jerry on uh, their work on circuit sculptures. They made these lovely, precise, small, beautiful things. And I went along to a music tech hack um, with um, Drew Festini and my composer friend, um, Andrew Hockey, with the idea of making this beautiful, small, precise object. Um, but then I realized that I, I'm a big mess, so, so do my <laughs> circuit sculptures are also this um, big, wavy mess. This is um, inspired by a Welsh harp, and it uses capacitive touch. And I'll talk about some of the technologies um, that I really like. So I, I love to use capacitive touch and gesture. Um, I've taught a lot of electronic engineers how to make instruments, but I've also taught a lot of musicians how to use electronics. And I always find the latter group make more interesting things because, you know, like everyone's heard the same square wave um, theremin um, from an Arduino, but actually when you get a group of people who don't know what on earth they're doing, but actually do know how to create music and create a good experience, they generally tend to use one of those two technologies, gesture or cap touch. It just happens. That's, that's just what they all use. It's, it, it's kind of crazy to me, but really cool. Um, this is another one I made. This is, a, this is the sub-bass creature. This is, so that previous one was a bit more generative. This is more of a traditional instrument. 
Um, and this is um, something I've been developing in collaboration with, there's a, a bassist called Isay Hassan, um, who um, is the bassist for The Savages, um, and is just is on tour at the moment, doing the bass for The Pixies, which is blowing my mind. So I'm making her one of these creatures. So it's been really interesting to work with a non-technical person who's um, who wants um, an instrument and kind of creating that with them. Um, so I, took, I went from experimental to traditional, and then I'm going back again to um, some of my other interests, which is soft circuitry. I like to go and pick weird materials. Um, I go to art shops more than electronic shops, and I'll go to an art shop with my multimeter to check the properties of the different materials. Um, um, so it, that's very inspiring to me. And then, so, and this is my, so I'm doing some soft circuit stuff. I really am very, very interested in electronic embroidery. Um, I think it's e textiles is something that's um, got huge potential. And I, I've actually got a new prototype of this. I'm making a human sized abstract cephalopod that sings to you when you stroke it. It's also pressure sensitive and proximity sensing. Um, the pressure sensing thing was kind of an accident that I discovered yesterday, so, but that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so it sings to you. Um, um, it's fluffy and big. It doesn't. It kind of works. We'll see. Um, I've got it over there. So if you see me around, I can uh, I can make it play something. I've just got one dismembered tentacle at the moment though. So everyone's like, is it tail? I'm like, no. All right. Um, and then this is a jumping off point too. So this is another project I've done. Um, so this is a flexible PCB. It's the second PCB I've ever designed. Really great. Love it. F fun, fun, fun. Um, but this is going to be a vocoder, so I can play it by touching my throat. Um, and it uses, as do the creatures, this here. This is a Bella, and this is a cap touch board. So capacitive touch, let me just move on. Uh, yeah, so basically capacitive touch um, is really annoying to work with on the body um, because it can't tell the difference between the skin underneath and your finger on top unless you've got very uh, sensitive sensors. So I've started using this sensor, which is a trill sensor. Um, they sent me a prototype of it, and I'm completely in love. It's like an NPR one to one, except it's got a different chip, it's got 30 pins, um, and it's way more sensitive, so I'm actually able to make working wearable cap touch um, instruments, which is kind of cool. So yeah, that, that's it. This is, um, and it plugs into this. This is actually a cape for a beagle board. Um, on the underneath of this is a pocket beagle, so it's like this big. And this is now my, um, my weapon of choice for making embedded instruments. Um, it's super fast, it's super small, and the killer app for me um, is that you can use um, established music technology. So um, when, when you're creating a sound, um, most of the, you know, unless you're a C++, um, whiz, um, you're going to be stuck with using other people's libraries and so on, but um, this is something that musicians use called pure data. And this is an open source piece of software that is visual block-based coding that allows you to create very, very complicated sound synthesis. And the cool thing about the Bella is you can just save your pure data patch onto the Bella and it will autoplay, which is an absolute, for me, it's like an absolute game changer um, in terms of the complexity of embedded instruments. So yeah, total, total pure data and Bella fangirl. Um, the other thing I really like to use, and I'm gonna tell you about one more project, um, is the micro bit, and I like using it because it's really, it's a children's microcontroller, and it's like $15, and it doesn't really do that much, but what it does, it does really well, and I find it kind of funny to use something really, really cheap and really, really simple to make really complex things. So yeah, this is one of my products. Um, it uses gesture control, it makes bleepy, bloopy music. Um, this is a, like a, a, a sewable speaker, um, and, um, and I was like, this is cool, this is cool, you know, it's just kind of nice. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a riff on this. So this is the Mimu Glove. This is um, de developed by a team in London, um, of which I am a part. Um, it is a professional quality uh, wireless gesture control device um, that allows you to interact with Ableton or Superglider or any kind of like professional music technology without um, interfacing with a laptop. It's essentially a very, very fancy MIDI controller, let's put it that way. It's been used on Ariana Grande's tour and blah, blah, blah. And I saw it and I was like, ah, oh, if I could make a kid's version of this, 11-year-old girls would lose their mind. And uh, I was right. So I made a kid's version of this with um, an advisory board of 50 girls. 
Um, <clears throat> these are this is the prototyping thing, and um, yada yada yada. Everybody likes it. Um, but the <laughs> reason I wanted to tell you about it is because then I was like, well, okay, that's cool. It makes bleeps and bloops. It makes square waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we all like chip tune music, but I wanted to go further with the chip tune, and I was really interested to see if we could do that um, with um, with this cheap microcontroller. Can I make a expensive MIDI instrument with a ten dot with a fifteen dollar um, microcontroller? Um, and first of all, I started off with this. Um, this is a gesture-controlled robot unicorn. I had a herd of them. Uh, I worked with a, an artist called Rena O, oh, who made me uh, who made me um, a very evil-looking glove to control my robots with. Um, this was kind of at the same time as I was developing the glove. And then I met this lass. And this is Martine Nicola Regina. She's an artist, and her liter she's known as the Moon Girl. Um, she is, um, she's an artist who works with um, an astronomy facility in, I think, the Netherlands. And she bounces signs off of the moon and then records them when they come back. So you get these wonderful distortion effects. Um, it's, a, it's, it's called the moon bouncing. And so I took some, she bounced the signs of a cello off of the moon um, and re-recorded it. And I took the, those signs of a cello um, and... In, and um, and then I was able to gesture control it. So it's like a, a gesture controlled moon cello sampler. Um, and that was, it was like $20 worth of materials and it worked perfectly. Um, all of the code for that is, and all of the instructions for that um, up on my GitHub, which is a hot mess, but there are some good stuff on it. Uh, but yeah, so that was that was really cool. And then I actually taught this woman how to use it. It's Bishy, she's a really cool musician. Um, and um, here she is with my children's glove, um, looping. It's like 15 bucks. Cool, right? Yeah, she's very talented. Thank you, Bishy. Um, and my point really is through working with several different artists and several different people from different disciplines, not just, not just technologists, but musicians, um, artists, um, all sorts of different people, you're able to get something that is like much, much greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and by sharing all of this technology, we're able to create this kind of community um, where we've... Um, given artists a chance to use $15 technology to create something that would not have been previously possible. This is something that would normally cost thousands and thousands of dollars, but by building on each other's work and by sharing our work in our community, um, we're able to do something pretty cool. So that's my time. I'm done 30 minutes. That's the end. I hope I'm leaving you with the idea that you don't need expensive equipment to make cool things in music technologies, and you also don't you don't need to be an expert musician or an expert engineer. Like, I'm a fairly crappy musician and a fairly crappy engineer, but together, <laughs> by <laughs> pushing, smushing those two things together and, like, making them kiss, like, I'm able to create some really cool things. Um, so, you know, just get involved and move beyond chiptune, please. Um, so, yeah, hack the planet. <laughs> make some noise. <laughs>